morning. So um, this morning again, we are blessed to have um, a guest pastor as Pastor Beck is on vacation. And um, his name is Pastor Dave Shank. He'll introduce himself a little bit more during his sermon, um, but we are very blessed and thankful to have him here this morning. Um, a couple announcements. Today's rally day, so that is very exciting. And um, if you're helping, I'm sure you've already been in touch with Stephanie, um, but if uh, you are around and need to offer your services for something else, make sure you see her. She's over here on the side. And uh, we're excited about that. Thank you to everybody who has already contributed to um, the uh, food ministry for Humble Walk this evening. Um, we've got some uh, chili made for them and um, a little bit of dessert and some side dishes. So um, we really appreciate um, everybody that's contributed um, for that so far and um, look forward to taking that down to them this evening. Um, I do not have any other announcements. Am I missing anything from anyone out there? Just so I don't pass anybody up. Stephanie. So for those who didn't hear for um, Facebook um, participants, um, since today's rally day, that means that next week is the official beginning of faith formation. So um, if you need more information, if you haven't signed up yet, please do that online or contact the office and they'll get in touch with Stephanie to um, help you out with that. Oh, Kay still needs one more person for the David trip. Oh, wait. She got it. I'm, I'm hearing from the side. She, she did. So if, if you need to talk to Kay about that, please see her um, after, after church. Absolutely. She would take more, but she needed that one more person. So, okay. We'll uh, get started with worship then. Thank you.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have, we have not, not loved, loved our neighbors, neighbors as, as ourselves. For the, the sake, sake of your, your Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, have, have mercy on us. us. Forgive, Forgive us, us, renew us, and lead us, so that, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your, walk in your ways to the, the glory of your holy name. name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. You're invited to share a sign of God's peace with your neighbor this morning. God's peace. Thank you. Peace.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. the name of your Son, to learn love from one another. Keep our feet from evil paths. Turn our minds to your wisdom and our hearts to the grace revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. get to see me a few times here this morning. Um, I'm going to just sing a really easy anthem, um, and it's number 623. If anyone at any point would like to um, hum along or join me, I'm always open to that. So. my 
switching hats. This morning, the first reading, excuse me, the first reading for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost comes from the 8th chapter of Amos, verses 7 to 14. The introduction. Amos was called by God to prophecy in the northern kingdom of Israel. Peace and prosperity in Israel led to corrupt business practices and oppression of the poor. The prophet declares that God will not tolerate such a situation. The first reading. Hear this, you that trample on the needy, and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah eph small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances. Buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Here ends the first reading, the word of the Lord. Be to God. Today's Psalm is Psalm 113 read responsively by the half verse. Hallelujah, give praise, you servants of the Lord. Praise, praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be blessed. From this time forth forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down. Let the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. God's glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who sits enthroned on high, but stoops to behold the heavens and the earth. The Lord takes up the weak out of the dust and lifts up the poor from the ashes, enthroning them with the rulers, with the rulers of the people. The Lord makes the woman of a childless house to be a joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. The second reading for today comes from the second chapter of 1 Timothy, verses 1 to 7. The introduction. The pastoral epistles offer insight into how early Christians understood many practical matters, such as church, church administration and worship. The church's focused prayer for others is an expression of the single-minded passion God has towards us in Jesus. The second reading. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, 
so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right, and is, it is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself human who gave himself a ransom for all this was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Here ends the second reading, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 16th chapter. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do? Now that my master is taking the position away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what... I've decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his, his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill, make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. The children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. But then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth. Who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It's wonderful to be here this morning. As I was driving up here, you can feel autumn quickly approaching. It was a absolutely beautiful drive here to Walkersville, and I am uh, just glad to be here with y'all today, very much so. Now, I would normally introduce myself at this time, and I'm still going to, but I know it's a little bit of a different situation with this congregation, because some of you have met me not too long ago, you may remember, 
uh, back in January, February, um, we had a uh, council retreat um, and some other teams of the congregation, I think may have been there as well. And we were at Marlu Ridge um, and I uh, was talking stewardship and uh, maybe some ways that uh, the church can uh, look at things a little bit differently um, and uh, giving some words of inspiration. And that's truly what I find myself doing in the position that I now serve within our Delaware, Maryland Synod. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Pastor Dave Shank, um, and I like to say I am your assistant to the bishop for generosity in our synod. And you may say, well, why do you emphasize yours? Because I take my work very seriously, especially the title assistant. I am here solely to assist our churches, our congregations, our leaders, and the members of our churches to continue their, what I like to call, generosity adventure in their lives. I like to encourage folks, when we are given the opportunity to see scarcity or abundance, we see scarcity. Oh, whoa, we see abundance. Are you awake? We see abundance. For we are abundant people. Generosity is a place where we are all called to serve. To give of our lives, our time, our talents, and yes, our treasure. But there's so much more to it than that. Living an abundance life, living a generous life, allows us to live out our cause as Christians in an inspirational, and thought-provoking way so that others that we meet along the road of our lives journey say there's something different about this person the way that they live generously the way that they live and give of themselves sacrificially it may cause that person to wonder to ponder, to pray, and to find their way into the arms of a loving God, and to find their way into the arms of Jesus Christ. So as my position as assistant to the bishop for your synod, I personally just want to say to you this morning, Thank you. Thank you for the way that you live abundantly in your life. Thank you for the way that you abundantly give of yourselves. To your church, to our synod, to your community, and to our world and beyond. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart and on behalf of Bishop Gold, thank you. There are three things that I like to do when I'm visiting our congregation. First, I do like to tell you a little bit about myself. I know that we've had some interactions in a retreat type uh, atmosphere, but I like to tell you a little bit personally about myself. I would be wondering if I was sitting in the pew, who is this strange person standing in my pulpit this morning? So maybe I can shed a little bit of light on that. I like to share the gospel message with the church that I am visiting. Goodness gracious, it's a challenging one, my friends, but one that we all need to hear and be reminded of this morning. And finally, I like to tie in to that gospel message the specific mission and vision of the church or where the church finds itself. I found a really fun connection with this church. And so that is where I will conclude my sermon this morning. But first, a little bit about myself. I was sharing before the service that I hail not too far from here. I was born in Hagerstown, Maryland. More specifically, my mom's from Smithsburg, 
My dad's from Weensport. I am educated at Towson University, local. Also, right down the road, I uh, studied systematic theology and ethics at Gettysburg Seminary. It will always be Gettysburg Seminary to me. Now united. And I hold my Master of Divinity from Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. I like to say that I am a proud son of an itinerant Methodist preacher. My father, with my mother right along his side, served in the Baltimore-Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church, which overlays our synod, onto our synod. Um, for over 40 years, Dad served. After uh, recently retiring and now him and Mom are full-time grandparents to my son, Gabriel, and my uh, brother's kids, Chelsea and Emma. I'd like to share a little bit about, more about my family. My wife is another pastor in our synod. She's serving at St. Michael Lutheran Church in Perry Hall, Maryland. And she's already had one service, and she's starting her other service right now as we speak. That brother that I spoke of is up near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he is a pastor, a priest, in the Episcopalian tradition. Wait, 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 there's one more. <laughs> my brother's wife, my sister-in-law, Erin, is also an Episcopalian priest who serves a church not too far from my brother's. My mother is the only one not ordained when we all get together for dinner, believe it or not, which makes for interesting dinner conversation. I could tell you more and more about my call story, but the one thing that I always like to share with congregations is that I never thought I would be here. That younger brother that I speak of, his name's Jason, he had the call from about the time he was the age of my five-year-old son. See, that was great. Jason got to live on the legacy. Jason got to carry on the ministry, and I got to do whatever I wanted to do, right? Yeah, see how that worked out, right? But the reason I share this is because God calls us into unexpected places. God calls us sometimes to step out into faith, into uncomfortable spaces. And the reason that I always share this part of my call story is because I like to share with folks in the pew, if you are hearing that voice of the Spirit, if you are feeling that pull to serve in a particular way, and I'm not talking about ordained ministry. I'm a big believer, it might be, but it doesn't have to be. I'm a big believer in the priesthood of all believers, that Luther calls us to do what we are called to do to the best of our ability, and through that, that is how we serve God. But it always starts with taking that first step in faith into that new thing, into that, what I like to call that undiscovered country, that wilderness. And so I ask and I remind you individually and as a congregation, are you hearing that stirring of the Spirit, especially today on our rally day? What is God calling for this new year, this new season, in your own personal life and in the life of this church? As I said before, the gospel message for this morning is perhaps one of the most challenging ones that pastors get to preach. I have been talking to my colleagues. I've been seeing them on social media. I've been seeing them online. They're all, I don't want to say complaining about the text this week, 
but there's been robust discussion of how difficult this text is. Part of the reason that this is such a difficult text is the way that Luke writes it. Especially if you go back to the original Greek, it's very jumbled. He starts in one direction and then he goes to another direction. There's an overlay of this story and then it kind of comes out at a different place, but it's all kind of woven together with this theme. This one theme that we cannot serve two ways. Two masters is the way that Luke places it. Some of the examples he uses is an honest manager versus a dishonest manager, or a shrewd person versus a unshrewd person. And of course, in the end of this passage, there is the explanation of one cannot serve God and wealth. The question comes for us here today in 2022 is what do we do with this passage? How do we understand the passage? One thing that I want to bring up, and one theologian that I read, theologian, pastor, writer, his name is Brian McLaren. You may have heard of him. He writes on this passage that you, to understand it, you have to also understand what is going on at the time that Jesus is using this illustration. At the time, debt relief was actually a hot-button issue in Palestine in Jesus' age. The idea that some managers were forgiving debt, others were not. You could see people were talking. Sounds sort of familiar, right? The idea of relieving one's debt or forgiving one's debt. It's one of the beauties of the Bible. I always believe that Biblically, you can find any human interaction between God or human to human, and because us humans don't change that much, the Bible is a continually living and amazing thing that guides us. So this discussion is going on, and Jesus decides to chime in. He decides to use this illustration. Join the discussion, if you will. But ultimately, he comes to the conclusion that one cannot serve God in wealth. I think for many of us, that would maybe cause us to pause, to reflect, dare I say, even bristle. How can I have things and serve God at the same time? How can I make a living or live in a society of capitalism and serve God at the same time? The answer comes through that generosity that I was talking about at the beginning. The idea that we cannot serve wealth in God at the same time actually comes down, again, if you look at the original language. The love of wealth, serving wealth, more specifically, is what this passage is getting to. And you could really kind of take that and put it into any place in our lives. If you put wealth above God, if you put something else above God, whatever idol you may wish to put above God, that's a problem. It causes us to separate further from our God. I think what Luke is trying to do here is calling our lives into a balance. A balance of generosity, generous living, giving of ourselves, giving of our money, so that we do not put that idea of wealth above God or make that our ultimate concern in life above our God. 
So again, I, I love to answer, or I love to uh, ask questions from the pulpit. And if I were serving here at St. Paul's, I would continue the conversation and study. That's what I really love to do. The sermon's only the introduction of truly getting into the gospel. But the question I would ask this week if we were studying this text together would be, how are we living generously in our lives? Individually, as a church, as a community. How are we living generous in our lives? I said before that I would close my sermon because I found a really neat little connection between this church and my own life. You heard me say at the beginning of my sermon that I went to Wesley Theological Seminary, right? I also uh, failed to, to share that my father went to Wesley Theological Seminary and my brother did as well. I served in the United Methodist Church for 10 years, actually, before coming over to the Lutheran roster. But what was really neat this morning is I saw in your bulletin, and I have, to, I have to mention this, you have this really cool part of your bulletin in the back that says comments from the cloud of witnesses. I'm intrigued by this. I would like to talk more about this. But it's written by Lawrence Hall Stuckey. Stuckey was my father's professor at Wesley. Pretty cool, huh? Right? He's a very well-known scholar in his day, in his age. But I think that these words of Stuckey really leave us at the place of conclusion for this message this morning when we are wrestling with this idea of generosity and abundance, the love of wealth, the love of God. The first part especially of this quote is where I will leave us this morning. Dr. Stuckey writes, Jesus commends the steward for taking an interest in the future. He foresees his future and provides for it. Now it seems that for many Christians, the chief concern has been to get to heaven after death. Too often a preoccupation for that aspect of the future creates an indifference to human values while on earth. But the future about which we are to think does not begin at some distant time after the resurrection of the dead. I want to read that again. But the future about which we are to think does not begin at some distant time after the resurrection of the dead. It begins now. It is the task of the church in every age to look at present practices and policies and ask, and this is the question I will leave you all with this morning, how will these affect tomorrow and the next day? So as we stand and sit here today on the rally day at St. Paul's Walkersville, I ask this question for this new season, for this new church year. How were the things that we do here in this community affect tomorrow and the next day? Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection in the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As scattered grains of wheat are gathered together into one bread. So let us gather our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of God's good creation. God, our Savior, you keep your church in faith and truth. Accompany those preparing for baptism or affirmation of baptism. Enlighten preachers, teachers, seminarians, and all those who share your good news with the world. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Divine teacher, you instruct your children to be responsible stewards of your creation. Show us how best to care for the earth and its resources and guide those who work to develop sustainable practices. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Ruler of the nations, you direct those in authority. Give leaders wisdom and compassion so that all may live in peace. Inspire public servants to follow the example of courageous leaders and safeguard the dignity of each person. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Helper of the needy, you lift up those who are oppressed. Breathe justice into economic and social systems that perpetuate poverty and hunger. Sustain food ministries, clothing banks, and emergency shelters, especially Glade Valley Services and Frederick Soup Kitchen. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Provider of comfort, you give us hope in our suffering. Seek out those who are lost or lonely, anxious or depressed, or struggling with addiction or illness. Provide for those in any need, especially Sharon, Rick, Henry, Lila, Gary, Hazel, Jack, Corey, Florence, Nancy, Noah, Bruce, Bob W., Joy, Jim, Dave, those on our prayer list, and those whom we name in our hearts or out loud. God, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Sustainer and giver of life, you bless this congregation with abundance. Instruct us in the proper and faithful use of wealth and resources that we share generously. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of glory, you gather your saints around the throne. Keep us thankful for the witness of those who have gone before us and bring us with them to the heavenly feast that has no end. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gathered together in the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, gracious God, we offer these and all our prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. 
As we sing our offertory hymn, you are reminded to place your gift in the offering plate, or you may mail it to the church office, and you can also consider online giving. Thank you again for all the ways that you give generously and abundantly. Out of abundance, you have have set set before before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for all of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed our duty and our joy, that we should at all times in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, We praise your name and join their unending hymn. And the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave it all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Amen. Gathered into one with the Holy Spirit, we now pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
All are welcome at Christ's table. Come as you are. The feast is prepared. The table is set. Come and eat. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.
We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, love your neighbor. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.